Uh, Gladys June Everson was a former undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin, and she got her degree in 1931. She went to the University of Iowa for uh, a master's degree and came back to Madison and did a PhD with, uh, Ste with uh, Harry Steenbock. Um, and she got her degree in 1941. After that, she was a um, professor at uh, University of California, Davis. And um, at her untimely death in 1969, she bequeathed her estate to the Department of Biochemistry. And those funds are used to support a lectureship um, that is dedicated to those who have been associated with the department uh, at any level. So um, I've always said that the University of Wisconsin has absolutely fantastic undergraduates. And um, we have experimental evidence, starting, of course, with Everson and continuing with Clara. Clara was my first undergraduate here at the <laughs> University of Wisconsin. Um, she set a very high bar. She graduated with a, with a 4.0, which I know is extraordinarily difficult to do in biochemistry. After that, she did her PhD with Doug Reese in California and postdoc with Steve Burley at Rockefeller University. She was an assistant professor at Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, and then moved to the University of Rochester Medical Center, where she is currently now. She has a long time interest in RNA and the proteins that are associated with it, and that's what she's going to start to talk to uh, today. So with that, I'll hand it over to Clara. All right, today I'd like to tell you about um, some new views of U2AF in pre-messenger RNA splicing. And I think this is pretty timely since U2AF has kind of come out as being a major splicing factor that's involved in a couple of different human diseases. So as many of you know, most of your genes contain introns, these intervening non-coding sequences that need to be excised from the pre-messenger RNA transcript before it's translated into proteins. And these introns actually can also serve as a source of non-coding RNAs. It's now known that almost all of your genes are alternatively spliced. That is, a particular part of the transcript is either included or excluded from the final uh. messenger RNA, usually to encode different proteins, also to regulate gene expression. And um, this, is a, this process is a major source of transcript diversity. For example, if you have, um, for each exon that's either included or excluded from a particular transcript, you have two to the n power different transcripts that are potentially generated. Now, I don't want to mislead you. In practice, there are only about three to four splice forms on average per human gene, although there are exceptions that have many, many more. But on average, there are only about three to four splice, form, splice forms per human gene. And in each tissue type, there are about two dominant splice forms that tend to take over in that particular tissue type. So it's pretty amazing that, you're, that, you're, that these splice sites are recognized and correctly excised at least most of the time. So the splice sites are marked in the transcripts by relatively short consensus sequences. At the five prime splice site, these include this relatively short sequence, which is a GU in the RNA, GT when you sequence the DNA. And at the three prime splice site, still short, maybe a little bit more of them, but pretty degenerate, divergent. Um, the sequences at the three prime splice site include a branch point sequence, which is this pretty conserved adenosine with a few other nucleotides. And at the three prime splice site, a highly conserved AG. And this three prime splice site AG is preceded by a polyperinate tract. <clears throat> What we're focusing on here are the early stages of three prime splice site recognition by a protein heterodimer called U2AF. And the large blue subunit here, U2AF2, normally recognizes the polypermine tract. This is the stretch of either C's or U's in RNA here that um, is about 20 nucleotides long and it precedes the AG. And U2AF is actually required for splicing most splice sites. It's thought to be important for splicing most of the major class of three prime splice sites. So you really got to have U2AF, you knock it out and your cells die. U2AF1 is more conditionally important. It's also essential for viability, but it's important for splicing a subset of splice sites that are dependent on this AG dinucleotide. They're called so-called 
AG dependent sites, and these usually have a relatively weak or degenerate polypro B tract. So U2AF, I think it's tremendously important. It's the most important one. However, I should not exclude the fact that there are about 170 loosely associated proteins that are important for RNA splicing. Now U2AF I like to think of as serving a role analogous to Tata binding protein in transcription. It has to recognize that three prime splice site and nucleate splice to some assembly. So it's a very important protein, but it takes a lot to get those splice sites identified correctly. So once U2IF has recognized the three prime splice site, it helps to assemble the core spliceosome, which is a more modest sized molecular machine. It's a ribonucleoprotein machine. It's RNA-based catalysis by five small nuclear RNAs, including the U4U6 dice nerf that you may have heard from, from David Brow and Sam Butcher's labs here. And the U1 stirp at the five prime splice site, U5 at the core, U2IF, as its name implies, it helps to recruit the U2 small nuclear ribonuclear protein particle, which also ultimately is part of the active site of the spliceosome. So altogether, we have this huge splicing complex of more than 240 protein factors, and all of these are important for bringing together the core spliceosome. So why do we care about u 2 f well, as I mentioned, it's one of the early stage splicing factors. It recognizes a three prime splice site and helps to recruit and nucleate spliceosome assembly. So I'm gonna show you this very schematic movie here with U2F uh, shown way proportionally out of size because the U1 and U2 snurps are much larger. But for purposes of illustration, U2F binds to the polypromity tract in AG, first with a splicing factor one which then exchanges with ATP hydrolysis for the U2 SNRP, which anneals with a branch point sequence with its RNA, a U2 SNRNA. And through a series of ATP-dependent conformational changes, a branched intron lariat is excised in two transesterification reactions. And actually, for splicing itself, you don't need ATP, and RNAs can accomplish the task of splicing but you do need ATP for RNP unwindases to chaperone the steps of the spliceosome assembly, and you do need proteins for efficient splicing. Another reason that U2F is important is that it recognizes these splice site signals in RNAs. And while inherited mutations of splicing factors are pretty rare in, in human genetic diseases because they're just lethal. If you have a mutation in a general splicing factor, you don't get very far in your <laughs> embryonic development. But um, mutations in the consensus sequences that mark the splice sites are very frequently found in inherited genetic diseases. And that's um, because if you're affecting just one transcript, that's going to be a more selective downstream effect than wiping out an entire spliceosome, which is pretty much going to be non-viable. Um, I've just shown a couple of examples here of genes that often have mutations in their splice sites. Um, these are relatively randomly chosen from the human gene mutation database. And U2AF recognizes a polypruning tract um, and, and the following AG. The AG itself is very frequently mutated. The polypromine tract, it's a little bit harder to document mutations there because it's in the intron, and usually these sequences are found through exome sequencing or uh, DNA sequencing, but it's um, also affected in certain, known to be affected in certain inherited genetic diseases. Now, more, most recently, it's been found that in more than half of all myelodysplasias, mutations have been acquired in splicing factors. Now, as I mentioned, you don't generally inherit a mutation in a splicing factor because it's, it's too lethal. But during pre-leukemias or myelodysplasias, these mutations are acquired at specific sites in a certain recurring splicing factor genes, which I'll go into more in a moment. Before I go into that, let me tell you a little bit, what is this myelodysplasia? To be honest, when this came out in 2011, I'm like, what is this disease? I've never even heard of it. So let me first introduce to you what a myelodysplastic syndrome is. So, Essentially, it's a disorder of the bone marrow, and I got these slides from uh, an MD at the U of R, um, but essentially the bone marrow cells have abnormal morphology, as can be, can be seen with Prussian blue staining. They, um, in certain types of these refractory anemias, 
the, the iron has precipitated and can be stained with Prussian blue. And um, these no longer are able to make um, blood cells normally. This is more common in the elderly, usually because of environmental insult. The poster child is actually a very atypical case. It's Robin Roberts from Good Morning America. But uh, she probably got breast cancer as a side effect of chemotherapy for, uh, she probably got MDS as a side effect of chemotherapy for her um, breast cancer. So usually this is gonna happen, it occurs in elderly males, not in a relatively healthy females. And the prognosis is poor, it often leads to death and that's because you can't make your blood cells, so you have, your, your heart has to work harder, so often patients will die of heart failure, they'll die of secondary infections because they can't make white blood cells, and um, they also sometimes have internal bleeding because they're not making platelets. So basically, your blood is really messed up when you have this disease, and um, currently there is no cure. The only cure right now is a bone marrow transplant. So it's, it becomes very important to understand the molecular basis, and maybe that can lead to new types of therapies. Um, for example, there are new um, splicing therapies that are currently in clinical trials right now. All right, so in 2011, it was found that uh, through whole genome sequencing that 60% of the affected genes in these MDS occur in splicing factor genes. And this was a real surprise because a splicing factor mutation is generally lethal. And in fact, if you express homozygous mutated splicing factors that, that carry these mutations in the MDS, it's lethal. But in the heterozygous state, these are always heterozygous, somehow these are leading to the MDS. And the molecular mechanism for that is still unknown. And I wish I could tell you more about that today. But instead, I'm gonna tell you about what I work on, which is the structure and biochemistry of these affected splicing factors. All right, so four splicing factors are recurrently mutated in MDS, and they're shown here. Among them is U2AF1 which is mutated in about 11% of MDS and also in some, in some, some lung cancers. ZRSR2 is actually a paralog of U2AF1 that's found in the minor class of spliceosomes. So it's really just a limited set of splicing factors that are affected. And the residues, the amino acids that change, are almost always the same ones in U2AF1. It's almost always S34, which is mutated always to a phenylalanine or tyrosine, a large aromatic residue. In a minor ca uh, cases, I think only about 15% of cases, a Q157 mutation will occur. And this Q157 mutation does not occur in lung cancers. It only has occurs in some MDS. So really, these mutations are concentrated in very specific spots. So uh, they seem to have a neomorphic or a, a new function that's, that's kind of exciting to the field. Much more rare, but does occur, are uh, mutations in U2AF2. Perhaps these are less frequent because U2AF2 is required for splicing. You can't, you can't mess it up too much. Um, but they do occur, and I'll, and I'll talk about them in, in a little bit of our work on those in a minute. All right. So what I'd like to tell you about today is um, the detailed structural work in, in my lab on how U2AF2 recognizes the polypermidine tract signal. And our, our recent work to see how U2AF2 polypermidine tract recognition is altered by disease associated mutations in the polypermidine tract and um, the MDS associated mutations. And then I just switched gears a little bit and look at U2AF1. We've recently looked at a uh, single molecule FRED of how U2AF1 can influence U2AF2, so I'd like to share that recent work with you. And also, um, we've looked at how the S34F mutation of U2AF1 can alter its RNA recognition. So let's first look at U2AF2 which recognizes the polypermidine tract here. So way back, like 15 years ago, when I started working on this protein, couldn't get it to crystallize. So in the, the typical crystallographer, I was working in a structural genomics lab. So our usual plan of attack was to cut out the protein, make it smaller. So using that strategy, I did manage to get crystals, which are shown here, the structure is shown here, but I had a 20 amino acid interdomain linker deletion. So this structure was useful. It had a nice publication in molecular cell for a starting assistant professor. And it did show us how the nucleotides are recognized by the two RMs. But it wasn't until quite recently, 
that we were able to show a more intact domain. And perhaps um, the lesson here for budding young crystallographers is don't necessarily shorten, maybe go out a little bit. So the, the way that we actually obtained the structure was by adding residues, about 10 residues on either side, and that helped to fold up the entire domain and then obtain the more intact RNA binding domain crystal structure as shown here. So what we see is that we have the two tandem RNA recognition motifs, or RRMs, that bind to nine nucleotides of a polypromine tract. And the inter-RRM linker folds across, it interacts with the two flanking alpha helical regions, and it actually recognizes the central nucleotide of the polypromine tract, which was lacking in our prior structures. So we went on to do mutagenesis and RNA binding studies. We can see that the interactions with the central nucleotide are important. They contribute about five-fold or one hydrogen bond of energy to recognizing the central polypromine uh, tract nucleotide. The N-terminus is important. A mutation to alanine of this glutamine residue decreases binding affinity by five-fold. And the C-terminus folds nicely across, uh, across the, the terminal nucleotide. I don't believe we tested that it's a glycine interaction here. But altogether, these make these nice interactions with the terminal nucleotides and the central nucleotide. It's all recognized by regions outside the core so-called RNA recognition motifs that typically are thought to interact with the RNA. And most strikingly, these flanking and inter RNA regions bind cooperatively. So by simply extending these core domains by 10 flanking residues, we increase the binding affinity to 35, you know, by more than 100 fold to that very comparable to the full-length protein. So in summary, what we know about U2F2 from this work is that the U2F RNA recognition motifs and alpha helical linkers recognize a nine nucleotide polypermidine tract. So then we went on to see if mutations in the polypromine tract that are known to be inherited in human genetic diseases would alter U2F recognition. And so we started first with um, a disease called retinitis pigmentosa. Mutations in this RP2 linked, uh, this RP2 polypromine tract shown here uh, are, are, sorry, excuse me, are inherited in X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. So they are uh, relatively commonly linked with X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, an inherited mutation. And so the inherited mutation is this U to A change here near the five prime region of the polypromine tract. And this is, if we determine the RNA binding affinity of wild type, uh, of the wild type sequence for U2F2, it's shown here, it's about two and a half micromolar, and this is a relatively short polyprene tract shown here. But with the, the U to A mutation, the RNA binding affinity does decrease, of so, uh, U2F does decrease. So through here, we can see that an A substitution in this polyprene tract that is inherited in X-linked retinitis pigmentosa does decrease RNA binding affinity of U2F. We then went on to see if a similar mutation in that's inherited in neurofibromatosis would also decrease binding affinity, and yes, it does. And by chance, perhaps not by chance, but um, I mean, not through our selection, but we were just looking for polypromine interact mutations that were documented to be inherited, and uh, it just, these are both in the same location. I, it's not because we cherry picked it, it's because they are in that site. It's a, it's a deleterious site to have an A substitution. In contrast, if we do a control mutation near the three prime end of the RNA, there's no effect or with an error, you know, it's very similar binding here. So there's something about this position on the protein that really needs to have a U, and this position can adapt to an A. And this led us to hypothesize that we have a sequence specific site on the C terminal RM2 whereas we have a promiscuous site on RRM. And to look at this more closely, we have actually determined structures of U2F with all four nucleotides bound at the promiscuous site. And uh, we'll just walk you through here quickly and show you how U2F can adapt to different nucleotides at this site. 
So with a C nucleotide, almost the same, whether with pyrimidines. And here I'm just morphing between a crystal structure determined with a C nucleotide versus a U nucleotide. You see the, an arginine side chain can simply flip to accommodate either nucleotide. If we mutate to an adenosine, again, the arginine side chain can flip. If we mutate to a guanosine, a little bit harder. So actually, u 2 seems to recognize a, a synguanosine, although a, a caveat of the structure is that we're using a deoxynucleotide, which can stabilize a synguanosine. So we, we then went on to leverage the structural information to show a direct link to U2F in cells. So we, we used our crystal structure to say an aspartate at this position is probably going to, um, in fact, disfavor a uridine oxygen here, whereas it can form a hydrogen bond with adenosine. So we mutated this residue to a valine, which packs very nicely with the uridine in a crystal structure. And then we show that if we introduce um, well, just by RNA binding, first of all, we show that this D231 valine mutant protein increases RNA binding to the RP2 site. And then we introduced this into cells, and to do this experiment, we used an RP2 mini gene. And we could show that if we co express wild type of U2F2 with the RP2 mutant, you know, I'm sorry, this is. Um, that we um, have a nearly complete exon skipping of the affected um, splice site. But if we introduce the mutant U2AF2, which now binds better to the defective splice site, we can restore normal splicing. This is an RT-PCR gel here. And down here is a, quanti a quantification of multiple replicates of the RT-PCR. And on the left, I'm showing a QRT-PCR assay of the splicing reporter. So from this, we can use our structural information to show a direct link between U2F2 and a recognition of this defective splice site. So it does appear that in cells, U2F2 is regulating this U2F2 is regulating the splice site, and it is being affected by the, the RP2-related mutation. So we conclude from this that disease-causing polyprotein tract mutations can alter splicing via U2F2 inhibition. This is not high throughput by any means, um, but um, it does show that in principle this does occur. So now let's look at the U2AF2 protein itself. Now U2AF2 is not the most commonly affected uh, splicing factor in MDS, but it does get mutated in some cases and also in cancers. So we surveyed the the cancer genome atlas and mapped the, the documented mutations along the U2AF2 um, structure. And we can see that the mutations cluster in the globular, the recurrent mutations cluster in the globular domains. And particularly, they tend to fall along the RNA interface, which um, seems to suggest that they could alter its RNA binding. So if we look more closely at two of these mutations to date, these are the two that we've looked at. Um, we looked at a glycine to aspartate mutation near the five prime region of the protein, or five prime region of the, of the RNA. And an asparagine to lysine mutation uh, that actually interacts with the central nucleotide. And if we introduce these mutations um, and do an RNA binding affinity analysis, we see that there is uh, definitely changes in it, the, the, the for binding of U2F2 to the representative polypromine tract. Um, the lysine mutation, as one might expect by introducing a positive charge, increases binding affinity by fivefold, and the um, aspartate mutation decreases the binding affinity by tenfold. So it does appear that these cancer-associated mutations, one is um, recurrent in AML, the N196K is an AML, which actually increases affinity, and the other one is in prostate cancer. So they do alter U2F binding affinity. And now we're going to try to look at some RNA-seq data on this in the future, so I hope I have more to tell you about that um, in the future. So altogether, how does U2AF2 recognize a 3 prime splice site? It does so via its integrated RMs, alpha helical linkers, and is it affected by disease-associated mutations? Yes, 
for the ones that we've looked at to date, and um, hopefully there will be more to come on this in cells soon. All right, so let's look at U2AF1 now. So how does U2AF1 influence splice site recognition, and how is it affected by mutations that are common in MDS? And this is a very technically difficult topic. So um, we're going to start by looking first at its influence on U2AF1, which is a more easily studied protein. And I hope that we'll have some tantalizing glimpses of how it might function in, in MDS at the end. So to date, we don't yet have a, a structure of full-length human U2AF1 recognizing this AG at the 3' splice site. What we do have is this core human heterodimer, which shows an atypical RNA recognition motif that actually doesn't bind to RNA, bound to a short peptide from U2AF2. This actually, this structure actually lacks entirely the zinc knuckles that carry the MDS mutations. A few years ago, a structure was determined of a yeast U2AF1, which is shown here. And this is the, this is the full length fission yeast U2AF1 protein with the affected residues and MDS shown here in yellow and it's bound to a slightly longer fragment of U2AF2. So this is a very exciting structure to many in the field. It shows the zinc knuckles and how they're integrated on top of this atypical RNA recognition motif. Um, they show these alpha helical extensions here. Um, and the MDS mutated residues are exposed on the surface where they could interact with other molecules or RNA. But um, it still doesn't have bound RNA. So we still don't know how the AG is recognized here. And it's been very challenging to obtain a U2AF1 RNA structure. Many are working on it, including us. So what we have done recently, which I think hopefully Aaron will appreciate, is we've been using single molecule um, um, fluorescence in c collaboration with Dmitry Ermolenko, who is our neighbor at U of R. And he traditionally works on ribosomes, but we've roped him into the splicing field. And um, so, it's challenging to label U2AF1 directly because it has cysteines, so zinc knuckle proteins. But what we had already been done, doing and successfully used to study U2AF2 is um, our labels that we introduce in the, in, the, in the distinct RNA recognition motifs. So we mutated, we placed single cysteines in each of the, of the RMs and um, label these with a mixture of Psi3 and Psi5, and that allows us to look at the interdomain transitions of the FRET transitions of these two domains in the protein. So we, we've done this, and this is published um, in uh, 2016 to look at uh, the interdomain conformational transitions of U2AF2 in the presence of absence of RNA. I'm just going to look at the review this quickly to look because we next will add in U2AF1, and we need to compare it with the U2AF2. Um, so in the absence of any RNA, we're tethering this protein uh, via a relatively long T has a glycine-rich linker and a histidine uh, tag here. So we, this is um, tethering the protein to the, the, the slide. Um, when we look at the, the protein in the absence, U2F2 protein in the absence of added RNA, it's a relatively diverse conformational ensemble. The RMs are uh, dynamic. Um, and this agrees with the lack of inter-RM contacts in the crystal structure. The, the direct contacts between the two RMs are relatively few, only this handful of hydrogen bonds shown here. Instead, they're glued together by binding to the RNA. And it also agrees with a relatively broad ensemble of conformations that is observed by single, by um, small angle X-ray scattering. We add RNA uh, by two different strategies. Um, this is the original strategy of immobilizing U2AF2 and adding the RNA in. Um, you can see that it stabilized a particular conformation, uh, a particular fret state that's about a half uh, fret efficiency, value of fret efficiency. And um, since in this particular immobilization scheme, we're also capturing, we're also viewing immobilized molecules that may not be bound to RNA, we compared a scheme where we immobilize the RNA and add the labeled U2AF. And we see that here, we still have a broad distribution of inter-RM arrangements, but we've stabilized selectively a particular inter-RM state that, that corresponds to about a half of fret value. And uh, this value of a half fret is at least agrees with um, 
uh, the confirmation that we're seeing in the crystal structure. This is side-by-side -side confirmation of the two arms on the RNA. Um, in contrast, there are, there's an NMR structure in the APO state that's part of this ensemble, which is back-to-back, -back, and that has a very high fret efficiency. And that might be this part over here, um, maybe, but it can only bind to RNA by a single RM. So that's a little bit more detail than we need, probably. But all right, so next we look to see how adding U2AF1 would change the inter-RM distribution of U2AF2. And to accomplish this experiment, we immobilize U2AF1 via this relatively lengthy tag, but nonetheless, this keeps it up off the surface. We're not gonna have, we don't have any detectable surface interactions. Um, we immobilize it via histidine tag, which then binds to a nickel NTA resin that has a biotin that is bound by neutravidin, and that's immobilized on the quartz slide. And then we flow in labeled U2AF2 and look to see how its interarm conversions, it's, see what its fret values are. So our results are shown on the next few slides. First, if you add um, U2AF1 to immobilize, or if you add labeled U2AF2 to immobilize U2AF1, no RNA very different from U2AF2 by itself. Look at this, this is beautiful, <laughs> stable peak at about 0.6 fret. So it's a higher fret efficiency and it's stable. So now if we add in RNA, uh, so first we bind uh, U2AF2 and we add in RNA. Uh, it's this prototypical ADML strong splice site RNA that includes the three prime splice site where U2AF1 will bind, um, changes. The fret value drops way down here to about 0.3. It's still a beautiful, stable confirmation. And these are very, I don't have it up here, but I'm happy to show later if anyone's interested. That these are very stable. There's, there's not a lot of dynamics going on here. These are stable confirmations that are stabilized by the presence of the U2F1 subunit. So this is really acting on the inter-RM confirmation of U2F2. And then for comparison, here I show an overlay with the scheme of U2F2. I'm showing an overlay with the scheme where we know U2F2 is bound to RNA. And you can see here the major fret state of U2F2 alone is intermediate. So it doesn't exactly correspond to either of these. So as a structural biologist, I'm super excited to see what are these? Is this going to be the crystal structure? It, it, it's much lower fret state. So. Um, and this one, could this be the back-to-back -back APO state? I don't really think so because I understand that fret values cannot be directly related to distances due to the kappa factor. Um, but still, this is much lower fret than would be expected for the back-to-back -back confirmation, which is expected to have almost 100% fret efficiency. So we'll have to wait and see. We've got to get those high-resolution structures see what's really going on here, but U2AF1 is definitely doing something to U2AF2. And this makes sense because U2AF1 regulates a completely a distinct subset of three prime splice sites that don't depend on the polypermian tract, or they have a degenerate polypermian tract. So it has to get U2AF2 to adopt a confirmation that's compatible with this subset of specific splice sites. All right, so again, we don't really know how U2F1 um, is recognizing the AG, but what we can do is we can use the MDS mutations actually as sort of clues to see how it is recognizing this, this spice site junction. Um, so these mutations that recur in the myelospastic syndromes are located in the zinc knuckle domains, and I'm showing one of them here, a structural homology model based on CWC24, which has 45% sequence identity. And um, the counterpart of the S34 residue actually interacts with the nucleotide. So this suggests, and I'm not showing it here, but Q157 is very similar. And this suggests that these residues are involved in RNA binding. So RNA-seq of patient samples and cell lines sort of supports this idea. It's found by a number of different groups and different publications that the minus three nucleotide of the affected splice sites differs in the presence of the S34F mutation of U2IF1 that's in MDS. With the MDS, with the S34F mutation present, typically the exons that are included that have increased splicing are preceded by a minus 3C 
and those that are skipped have a minus 3 U or T here in the genomic DNA sequence. And this would suggest that perhaps that S34F residue is contacting and recognizing that site in a different way than the wild type serine. So to test that, we again used our purified um, proteins. That I'm making it look easy here, but these are actually really hard to make. So <laughs> we're one of the few groups in the field who are actually making these. Work. So we have our U2F1, which expresses best as an MVP fusion, and then we cleave that off and do <coughs> gel filtration and mix, mix some, yeah. So, but we found that it was, uh, we've got the most reproducible results and the highest signal to noise if we use the ternary complex for our fluorescence and ice terpene assays. So we're, here we're working with an entire ternary complex, not U2F1 alone. So we use this purified protein complex for RNA binding affinities. We use fluorescein and isotropy. We're sort of limited to the techniques, biophysical techniques that we can use by amounts of protein. Of course, we're, we're not really able to use isothermal titration calorimetry. We just don't have that amount of material. Um, but we can um, use our complexes for, for fluorescence and isotropy with a fluorescein labeled RNA splice site. I do want to point out that we don't have any differences in fluorescence emission intensity, um, which could lead to small changes in your apparent polarization. But we, we, these, are, these are the same. Um, before and after the titration. All right. So to date, at this point, we've done 19 different sites. And I don't know. It's satisfying and unsatisfying in some ways. So um, in general, we see that the affinity trends do agree with the splicing in all cases except for MED15 was sort of an outlier here. It had a... Um, yeah, there's a difference in the affinity that doesn't quite agree with the splicing. In many cases, the S34F mutation will decrease binding to a minus 3U, but not always. And in some cases, it will increase binding of this U2IF1 containing ternary protein complex to a minus 3C. So, okay. Um, the, but, so we get these trends, they match the splicing data, but they're very subtle, it's only two to seven fold change. So this is okay, but I think there has to be more to the story. I don't know if it's going to be underlying differences in the binding kinetics, because these are equilibrium apparent binding RNA binding affinities. I don't know if it's roles for other splicing factors that are present in cells that we just don't have in hand and we don't know what they are, like PRP5 that Aaron is working on. Um, but I'm sure there's gonna be more to this um, I don't want to leave you here saying, oh, well, she measured RNA binding affinities, and the biophysics says, well, it's just a difference in binding to that site. Uh-uh. No, no, no. <laughs> so we have these subtle differences, and they do agree with the, the splicing data, but they're, they're very small changes. I mean, right, Ivan, this is like a two-fold change. That's not even a hydrogen bond. So there's a lot more to come here. All right, so what do we know about U2F1? Um, U2F1 influences splice site recognition. Um, via what U2F2 does appear to be one mechanism of structural action by U2F1. And mild dysplasia, MDS-related U2F1 mutations, particularly the S34F that we've looked at in detail, does affect RNA binding to, to, to affect the splice sites, but in a very subtle way. All right, so that's most of what I have to say today. I just wanted to also point out that for all other uh, MDS-associated uh, mutations and splicing factors, that the RNA interface does seem to be a recurring theme, and maybe this is related to the action of RNA helicases that have to dissociate these proteins, that you're going to somehow alter the RNA recognition, and that's going to have downstream and other effects. Um, the SO3B1 hotspots <coughs> map to the, the pre-messenger RNA. Um, the other mutation of U2IF1 interacts with RNA based on homology with MBNL1 have a structure. And SRSF2, the proline that's involved, also contacts RNA. So it seems to be a recurring theme that at least these mutations do mark out important interfaces, just like uh, 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 maybe a, a more a model system in the lab where you're doing um, mutagenesis. Well, this is, this is sort of like biology doing an experiment, and, it's, and biology has shown us that these are the important interfaces of these splicing factors, and now it's up to us to figure out what are they doing. All right, so much more to come.
And that's the end of my story, my never-ending story of splicing factors. So um, I just want to thank um, Dmitry Ermolenko for doing the single molecule fret with Shandari Warnasuria. And Rakesh Shatwiki, who's now a postdoc at UPenn, did the U2IF1 studies. He's a trooper. He made all those proteins. And Anna Agarwal um, did the U2IF2 work. In particular, he came up with the idea of the D231V mutation. So these are really great um, young scientists out there. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Clara, for a fascinating talk. Um, questions? Heidi. Yeah, I was curious about the pattern of U2A2 mutations that you showed, because you said there were a couple of hotspots primarily in AML and MES, but the rest of the mutations seem to be consistent with a loss of function. So is that particular to some cancers? Or yeah, so we simply the surveyed the, the cancer genome atlas, which is not necessarily, so these are actually from a variety of different cancers. It just happened that the Asparagine 196K mutation was only observed in leukemias. Um, the other ones are in a variety of cancers, so they don't seem to be um, any particular cancer. The glycine mutation is in prostate and colon cancer, so and it recurs in only that type of cancer. So I, I don't know if, you know, they're not that common, so I don't think we have enough data to draw. Uh, Well, yeah, heterozygous solution. I'm not sure. Um, I know if you knock it down, cells do survive. People do knock down U2F2, but there's still some remaining. So I would say probably they would be. Maybe it's it's certainly embryonic lethal in zebrafish. You can't do a, You can't make a knockout of U2F2. Um, but yeah, I think yeah. So thank you. So the PrEP data was really striking, going from this distribution to these really beautiful. Right. <laughs> and it, it kind of made me wonder, um, like, how many other things could influence that confirmation? So right. So, like, SF1, for example, is there a oh. mutation to, to U2AF or vice versa? <laughs> and I'm just wondering if you. I was thinking, when you said other things could influence, I was thinking, is it Shandani's hands? Just I mean, it's such really beautiful data recently, and the other is kind of like a mess. It looks like, um, but yeah, um, so she, actually Shandani wants to do a lot of controls with, but for, yeah, I, th I wonder if, so in this, in this construct that we're using, the C-terminal domain of u 2 we're really technically limited, right? The C-terminal domain of u 2 f 2 has five cysteines. So in the construct that we're using, it has a C-terminus that corresponds to the crystal structure. It does not have the interaction domain for SF1 in it. So I agree, but it's harder to look at. Or do you think that u 2 f could also influence SF1 structure? Could it be? Well, SF1 is just one. It's like a little rock. It's like a. It, it's not like if U2AF is a multi-domain dynamic protein, and SF1 is the KH domain. This is what we know, and it also has a zinc knuckle that nobody pays any attention to. So um, I don't think a lot of dynamics are going to be happening with SF1. Now SF3B, <laughs> maybe that would be interesting. Yeah. So you may have covered this, and I might have missed it, but. I'm a little confused by splicing is a whole genome sort of process. So presumably all the transcripts in the cells will be possibly affected by mutations in the splicing factors. And so then you kind of get this very specific disease that occurs when right. you have those mutations. So I'm kind of wondering, like, what is it that causes such a specific disease phenotype? Um, I think the whole, this is the whole field, and I, I, as a structural bias, I'm not equipped to, to address it uh, with experiments. However, that's what the whole field is wondering. Why do we have these splicing factor mutations that are, they're actually deleterious to, to cell proliferation, yet somehow they're leading to leukemia down the line, and th they're early stage, and they aren't, they don't necessarily persist. So if, 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 if there's a loss of the, of the, the splicing factor mutation, you still have MDS. It's not required to maintain MDS. <laughs>
so I think that's that's really the holy grail: is why does one generate the other? Um, and so it may be RNA splicing, but there's only a handful of misspliced transcripts, and there's not a lot of overlap between, say, an SF3B1 mutation and a U2IF1 mutation. I mean, I guess we were kind of expecting that there would be like just a few transcripts that are misspliced in all of them that would be related to MDS, and that would be those transcripts that are causing the disease, but there doesn't seem to be any core subset that's really related to it. So I'm actually wondering, maybe Aaron could, could say this, if, if we might be, these aren't just splicing factors, they're also involved in transcription. Their SF3B1 is chromatin associated. Uh, U2AF2 uh, paralogs are involved also in transcription. So, and the U2AF1 mutations have been shown to affect alternative polyadenylation, which is harder to look at by RNA seq, but it has been done by the Green Group. So, I'm wondering actually if there might be some other pathway that is being really messed up, like DNA repair. Um, I think that's something for future work by maybe a more multidisciplinary group of investigators than, because I think everyone is very splicing centric right now. The splicing people like me are pretty happy to have our, our proteins have these mutations that are so disease relevant, but maybe it's not just through splicing that this is really happening. Right. So, I don't, what made you think of that? Because I. So, uh, one would think if they, you know, if you have an uh, RNA binding protein, will have on the RNA that's going to sort of inhibit its ability to back thread into the DNA, and then if it backs to the DNA, that's like for um, sort of a, you know, it could be a significant DNA damage. Like, um, so, Tim Grobert at um, Mass General Hospital has done some work on that, and I believe he did see that there was an e increase in R loops. Um, but I don't believe he's published that yet, but I, th I think, yeah, that's a great question, and I believe the answer is probably yes. So the, the second question is, uh, so I have a little bit of interest in non-collinear splicing, so I don't know if you know whether or not any of the U2AF2 uh, mutations are associated with um, sort of an enhanced uh, non-collinear splicing. Are you, do you mean recursive splicing? So I'm not sure if that would... So, I don't know. So. I thought it might be actually it was, because it's just technical difficulties again. So the DK, which is one of the major, it's an oncogene and it's one of the major affected u 2 one sites that we've done, we've done the most work on that. But we wanted to make a mini gene. The stupid has got a 70,000 KB intron. So I thought, you know, maybe this has to be recursively spliced. But so we started to try to look at that, but we didn't get very far. It was sort of a tangent. But yeah, that's what I was thinking because it just happened that this very affected gene has this huge intron, and so I was like, okay, maybe it's recursively spliced. How in the world are these splice sites finding each other? Um, but yeah, I don't think anyone has looked at that rigorously, but that's a good point. I guess I have time to process well. I have a question, mm -hmm. sort of a follow-up question. So it seems like um, the obvious thing to do would be look at the RNAs in the cells with and without these mutations and see what kind of changes there are in the pattern of the splice Mm -hmm. which many groups have done, Has right? That been done? Yes, yes, and that's where the sequence logos that I showed up here for the minus three C, A, G is from RNA seq analysis, and um, those were from patient samples, cell lines, um, both lung, lung cancer cell lines and leukemias. So yes, definitely. So there's one some big differences in small differences. Small. It's all subtle. Small. And the, the sequence logos, they agree with our RNA binding analyses. But I guess the question is, is that enough? And how does that actually lead to uncontrolled, uh, this really defective bone uh, marrow cells? Right, so, uh, yeah. That's right. And the structural model, it makes perfect sense actually if, um, because the, it, it, the Q157 mutation, which is in the C terminal zinc knuckle of U2IF1, it affects, has a sequence logo of changed splice sites at the plus one position of that splice site. 
And that makes sense because you have the S34F residue in, in a structural model with RNA. The S34F residue is perfectly fits at the minus three position and then the Q157, this falls at the plus one position. So if you just simply take known structures and you look at them, it, it does make sense, um, especially using the newer CWC24 structure. Um, don't use the TIS, don't use the NMR TIS 11D because I think that the RNA is backwards, but if you use all the newer structures, then it, it does make perfect sense, yeah. <laughs>